Okay, good morning. We're going to go ahead and officially get started this morning. Um, my name, as always, is Ginny Davis, and I'm the principal of Piedmont Hills, and welcome um, to Zoom with the principal this morning. Um, I am really excited about this topic, and I'm, ex I'm actually really happy that in the chat, a lot of you are unfamiliar with what executive functioning is. Um, it's something that in education, we deal with a lot. Executive functioning issues are very, very common. Um, but it's not a term that I personally was really familiar with until about, oh God, like five, five six years ago, um, you know, where I really became familiar with this term. Um, but, but even prior to that, because I've been in education, this is actually my 24th year in education, um, as a teacher, very familiar with the students that, um, you know, when I would talk to their parents, like they would just have this frustration of my kid has done the work, um, but it's at the bottom of their homework or I mean, the bottom of their backpack, you know, and like kids like have all the papers just mooshed in their backpack and they don't seem to have any sort of um, you know, organizational system, they will forget to do assignments or they forget what they have to do. Um, and it's just so, so common. And now, you know, so like I'm saying, I dealt with that as a teacher for many, many years and helping parents and students with these struggles. Um, now as a parent, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now. Um, now as a parent, I um, also um, have the same struggles. Um, I, my son, who is in the seventh grade, um, God love him, you know, I was looking at, you know, the power school, um, and they, he had a zero for this homework assignment for his science class, and I look in Nathan's backpack, and there it is crumpled down at the bottom of the backpack, fully, completely finished, but he had not turned it in, and just, and it was just so, like, oh gosh, I have that kid, um, and so, Last year, at the end of the year, our school psychologist, Emily Mathay, who I'm going to turn um, this over to in a minute, gave a presentation to the staff about executive functioning. And I was watching her presentation thinking this would be something really great to bring to the parents. Um, this was at the very end of the school year last year. And so this was you know, my intention that at the start of this school year that we would bring this topic to the parents because it's a really important topic. It's so common for uh, students to struggle in this area. Um, and I promise you so many parents um, are, you know, have kids that are dealing with executive functioning issues. And so my hope for today is that you'll leave with some tips and strategies that you can try at home to um, help ease this burden there is no like just do this and the problem is solved um, because if there were like you know that magic bullet so to speak um, <laughs> this wouldn't be an issue um, so just keep that in mind there is no magic bullet fix for this um, but hopefully you'll leave with some um, a better understanding of what executive functioning is and hopefully have some tips and strategies on how to help your child with this so let me introduce Emily Mathay um, Emily is our school psychologist um, so she this is some this is an area that she is um, I don't know if Emily, if it's saying you're an expert is maybe like too much, but um, definitely is pretty knowledgeable about it. So Emily, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, I would say more very familiar <laughs> based on uh, you know, the experience of working in a school. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen. Okay. So today we're gonna be talking about executive functioning. Um, and what I hope you take away from this presentation um, is that you have a more you know, general definition or an understanding of executive functioning, um, understanding the different mental processes involved um, and what this looks like, how the deficits in executive functioning um, present themselves and what's considered developmentally appropriate, um, and also what you can do to support the growth of executive functioning skills in your child. So executive functioning is tricky because there is no universally accepted definition. And this occurs for a few reasons. Uh, the first reason being that there are a lot of different mental processes involved. And from a neuropsychological perspective, we don't fully understand the nature of these processes quite yet. Uh, but this is a blooming field and it's growing every day. 
um, definitions also change based on the utility for specific professions. So you might hear a different definition by a neurologist than you would from a psychologist. But there are some central themes in each definition. Um, I've chosen to define it as uh, Merriam-Webster defines it because for me, this is the most easy to um, comprehend. So Merriam-Webster will define it as a group of complex mental processes and cognitive abilities that control skills that are necessary for goal-directed behavior. Um, there's different types of executive functioning skills that we'll talk about, um, and there's a lot that are involved. I'm going to focus on six today, um, mostly because they're the most uh, prevalent in school. So executive dysfunction in adolescence can take many forms because of the amount of um, mental processes that are involved. So some examples that we see, um, especially in school, so they can look like poor time management, um, procrastination, behavioral outbursts, um, an emotional reaction that's greater than the situation, poor work completion, inability to maintain attention to task, um, missing information in notes, homework, et cetera, um, disorganized papers, school supplies, workspace, or living area, um, and impulsive behavior. And I know in a lot of ways, it sounds like I'm just describing adolescence. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about how the brain um, develops during this time period and what we can expect. Um, so the first thing I wanna share is that there are some different impacts, biological and environmental, that can affect the growth of executive function skills more globally. Um, so this can be neurodevelopmental disorders, such as ADHD or autism, uh, psychological disorders, so mood disorders, schizophrenia, obsessive compulsive disorder, um, physical and mental trauma, so um, neglects, abuse, um, traumatic and non-traumatic brain injury. Um, for those who are unfamiliar, traumatic brain injury is um, internal force on the brain, non-traumatic is internal, so a stroke, um, aneurysm, things like that, lack of oxygen. Um, and then there are environmental factors that will also impede the growth such as exposure to toxins in utero, addiction, or lack of exposure or utilization of these skills. Um, I think it's important to talk about the lack of exposure or utilization, mainly because we came back to school this year after being home for about a year and a half. Um, so a lot of our students um, are a little bit behind on developing some of those skills, um, but children at this age are very resilient and they tend to uh, grow and catch up really fast. So this is something that we're seeing in the school that's largely due to the lack of exposure of being in the school environment. Um, and part of that is because executive functioning skills are innate. Um, so everyone's born with um, a predisposition to develop these skills. But if they're not used, they kind of are pruned or weeded out, right? So there are also temporary impacts that I wanna discuss. So temporarily, executive functioning skills can be diminished by certain daily factors such as mood, lack of sleep, uh, poor diet, or even missing a, a meal, um, illness, et cetera. So for the purposes of education, we're gonna focus on six different uh, domains of executive functioning. So we're gonna look at attention, planning, organization, uh, task initiation, time management, and self-regulation. So attention may be defined as a state in which cognitive resources are focused on certain aspects of the environment rather than on others. Um, and the central nervous system is in a state of readiness to respond to stimuli. So we're alert, we're awake, and we're ready to focus. Um, attention can be broken down into two categories. So there's controlled attention and then there's automatic attention. Controlled attention involves um, actively sustaining attention on a given stimuli. Um, it's largely dictated by the prefrontal cortex and the frontal lobes. Um, this is effortful attention. And this is the piece of executive functioning that we'll be discussing. Um, automatic attention is involuntary and is usually driven by more primitive parts of the brain um, that control different automatic processes, such as the brain stem, uh, the cerebellum. Um, and other things that affect attention is gonna be past experiences. Um, so we notice things that have meaning for us. For example, if you're in a store and someone says your name, but they're not with you, it's going to direct your attention, right? Um, can also be captured by um, stimuli in the environment. Um, so a loud noise, 
something that's novel or, or unfamiliar to us. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the connection between attention, working memory, and inhibition. You'll see inhibition a lot if you um, if you do some Google researching on executive functioning because it is a big component, um, but it is something that is um, largely involuntary or you know um, takes place in a more primitive part of the brain that can impact attention and working memory. Um, so working memory and attention are also when you look at uh, neurology, they they almost use them interchangeably, right? So sustained attention um, involves utilizing, so working memory, let me start here. Working memory um, is defined by the ability to temporarily store information in conscious awareness, right? So we need that sustained attention in order to gather that information and remember it. Um, and actually they're so intertwined that when you look at different interventions for you know, increasing sustained attention, they're all utilizing working memory tasks. Um, so I do this sometimes with some of my students. They actually have some fun working memory games or apps on your phone. Um, so like building that working memory, they can actually increase their span of sustained attention. Um, and inhibition refers to the act of blocking or delaying a response to a stimuli. Um, so a lot of times we'll be distracted by these impeding thoughts or impeding stimuli in our environment. Um, and there are some different strategies that you know you can provide for your, your well here. Um, so one thing that I like when I'm working with students with ADHD, a lot of times there's impeding um, thoughts, right, that are um, competing for their attention. So when I have a student that is um, has spent three or four hours on homework because they have these intrusive thoughts that are competing for attention, um, so what I do is I always recommend a clean workspace. You know, put your phone out of sight or a little bit behind you. This way, you don't see the screen. Um, having a designated work area. Um, and one thing that I like that works for a lot of my students that also works for me um, is to keep a pad of sticky notes on the desk. And anytime there's a competing thought, just to write it down. This way it's out of the mind and it can be addressed later. Um, and then afterwards, I always recommend students go through the sticky notes and prioritize them. Is this something that needed my attention right away? Did you leave the stove on? No, then usually it's something that you can take care of after the task at hand. Um, so the development of controlled attention, it's a top-down process, which means it, it uh, is controlled by those higher order functionings of the brain and the prefrontal cortex um, and increases from development uh, through infancy and adolescence. So you'll see um, a greater ability to sustain attention typically um, as students age. Um, and this is congruent with just the development of the prefrontal cortex. A lot of executive functioning skills are dictated by this prefrontal cortex, which is the last part of our brain to completely develop. Um, so this part of the brain actually doesn't fully develop until about age 25. And it often blooms through adolescence. So this is why we see a large discrepancy a lot of times between ninth and 12th graders um, because a lot of that cognitive development takes place, and that's when a lot of these executive functioning skills can be utilized. So when we're measuring attention in school, you know, it's hard to, to know what's normal and what's not normal. Right? Because measuring attention can be difficult because if they're um, inattentive due to competing stimuli internally, um, they could be staring at the teacher and thinking about what they're going to have for lunch, right? Um, so typically the way that we would measure attention is um, through observation and comparison to peers. So we're looking at active engagement, passive engagement, um, and how that compares to their peers. Generally, um, I see students with about 80% of attention to be uh, average. Um, we also look at degree of impact. So if we see a student who's struggling to maintain attention and it's impacting their ability to progress in school, gather notes, um, then that's something that we need to address. So next I'm gonna talk about planning. Uh, planning is the mental processing and subsequent actions taken to reach a desired goal. Um, so developmentally appropriate planning in adolescence involves both short-term and long-term planning. Short-term planning such as writing down daily homework, finishing assignments within the week or month, um, to long-term planning. So monitoring grades, selecting courses, um, that are based on what you want to do after high school 
and choosing activities that facilitate you know, preferred post-secondary career or education. So some tips to improve planning that you can utilize at home. Um, use of a planner. This is a big one. A lot of our students, um, especially now, are either relying on memory or relying on the online portals. Um, so because the teachers are posting everything on Google Classroom right now and School Loop, um, which they usually do post the homework, but it's not always all in one place. So for example, if you have a teacher that's using School Loop and not um, uh, Google Classroom, it might not be on that screen. So they might just completely forget about it because out of sight, out of mind, right? Um, so using a planner in school, but you can also go through um, your, your child's Google Classroom and School Loop with them after school and just write down the different homeworks for that day. Um, it's a good habit to get into and eventually these habits become ingrained. Um, it's also helpful to set aside some time for planning. So if this is an area of weakness for your child, I would spend maybe 10 to 15 minutes at the end of the school day going through their assignments with them, making sure it's written down and creating a checklist in their planner with them. Um, if they don't have a planner, you can also use other forms of checklists. Using a whiteboard or a monthly calendar to help them plan for projects, tests, or assignments in advance. Calendars are also good because they provide a visual and our students work really well when we have um, kind of a visual reminder and especially a visual timeline um, just for perception of time because children tend to misperceive time. Um, and then breaking down large assignments or studying for a test into smaller components with individual due dates. So for example, if you have, if your student has a test in a month, you might ask them to study certain amounts, certain chapters by this week, certain chapters by this week and so forth. Organization is also another um, area of executive functioning that we often see deficits in in high school. Um, and this encompasses the ability to order information, materials and spaces. Um, and involves how we gather stimuli in our environment to complete tasks quickly and efficiently. Um, it's also how we arrange our environment and provide order and structure to the items and activities around us. It's closely linked to planning and therefore deficits with uh, organization are common among students who exhibit difficulty with planning. Um, so typical development is going to change through the high school years um, and this will range from 9th through 12th grade. Um, the goal in this period is to build those necessary skills to organize educational information such as notes, uh, materials, so your backpack, your binders, um, and the spaces, so your desk, your homework station, and your room, wherever they do their work. Um, some tips to improve organization. So you might wanna create a designated space for school materials. Um, I like keeping a backpack near the door or somewhere where it's um, you know, clearly visible on the way out. Um, create a designated time to organize materials. So again, you might spend 10 to 15 minutes at the end of the day um, going through their school materials and making sure everything's in the right place. Um, helping the child create a checklist of necessary materials that they might need for the next day. Um, create a homework routine. Model organizational skills at home um, and praise for good organizational skills. All right, task initiation. This is the ability to initiate and independently start a task. Um, so this includes generating ideas, solving problems, responding to instructions without needing other support. Um, so teens with task initiation issues might need many reminders from adults to start a task, um, delay chores and homework until they need to finish them or in a rush, um, frequently ask for help even with simple tasks or engage in problematic behaviors to escape or avoid tasks. Um, so it is typical for adolescents to avoid some non-preferred tasks um, and to put these off for a certain amount of time. However, when it's uh, difficulty is impeding the ability to complete many non-preferred tasks or any non-preferred tasks to the point that their academic progress is impeded, then they might need further support. Um, so some tips to improve task initiation. Again, breaking down assignments into smaller parts. This perceptually feels much less overwhelming for children and they might feel a little bit more inclined to begin an assignment. Um, set motivators to help the child or adolescent maintain motivation. Um, so this can look like, you know, not allowing them to watch TV until they finish their homework, um, something that motivates them to, to complete the task. Uh, creating a designated workspace, which helps them get into kind of the mindset of doing work um, and reducing distractions to the student. 
time management. So time management refers to a broad set of skills related to understanding time and how we use time effectively. Um, and this can impact ourselves and others around us. Children and young adults with good time management skills not only understand how long tasks will take, they're also able to budget time effectively and complete routines with ease, right? So this includes our capacity to estimate time, allocate time, and stay within time limits and deadlines. Some tips for improving time management. Um, create checklists and have the student estimate how long this might take. I do this a lot of times with my students and it's always completely different than the amount of time that it actually takes. So just having that feedback of this is how long I thought, this is how long it actually took can help them kind of build that skill. Um, breaking long assignments into chunks and assigning time frames for completing each one. Using a calendar to keep track of long-term assignments, due dates, chores, and activities. Um, and then writing the due date on the top of each assignment to, just to keep it fresh in their mind. Self-regulation, uh, this refers to the self altering, altering its own responses or inner states. Um, so this takes the form of overriding one response or behavior and replacing it with a less common but more desired response. This includes also the ability to delay gratification, um, such as when you know a child decides not to eat the cookie on their plate to have two cookies from the oven. So difficulty with self-regulation can look like emotional impulsivity, low frustration tolerance, um, mood lability, which is sudden or exaggerated mood changes, um, temper outbursts or disproportionate anger and frustration. To improve self-regulation, um, students can use a lot of scaffolding with this. So this is um, the parent, teacher, you know, administrator verbally processing events with the child, um, helping them create kind of an inner script or a schema and an appropriate behavioral response. Um, ask the child to label their emotions and then utilize ref reflective practices um, when they're not in the throes of an emotion. So if a, a child is having a behavioral outburst or the emotional reaction is large for the situation, you might want to try some de-escalating tactics or wait until they're calmer and then um, process that information with them. Um, so this can take the form of discussions. Um, meditation and yoga are also great self-regulation practices. So I did want to note that adolescents will exhibit poor decision making at times. This is typical and to be expected and isn't necessarily um, a symptom of emotional executive uh, dysfunction. And this happens for a lot of reasons, um, mainly because the neurology of the brain is not quite there yet, right? So all of those neural networks in the prefrontal cortex are not quite developed yet. And that's the part of the brain that's going to help us make appropriate decisions. Um, and so the, I included here some, uh, you know, neurology jargon that if you want to read further into, you may. Um, but to summarize, essentially, the part of the brain that's responsible for appropriate decision making is not quite built yet. And teens have an enlarged amygdala, which is our emotional response part of the brain, which is deep in the limbic system, a very primitive part of our brain that tends to take control of our actions and behaviors when the prefrontal cortex cannot. So overall, um, overall skills can be benefited through a couple of things modeling through from parents, teachers, administrators, the adults in their lives, um, scaffolding. So this is doing things with the child to help them work through it, which is going through the planner with them, helping them organize those materials, et cetera, um, creating a routine and being consistent with routines. Consistency is a big component of building these executive functioning skills. And Thank you all. And I'm going to open it up to some questions now. Thank you, Emily. I, I don't know about the parents. I was writing down notes of like, oh, this will work with Nathan. <laughs> and I need to um, try that. Um, OK, so we've got a question. Um, ADHD, how parent teacher sees and recognizes kids in the student? Child's been labeled as ADHD. Will the school have plans to help a student? Mm -hmm. You want to take that one <laughs> or I can take that one. <laughs> yeah. Um, so ADHD can present itself uh, in different ways, right? So you have students who are um, 
inattentive, who are hyperactive, and then sometimes combined. Um, so finding the students who have ADHD and attentive type can be a little bit more difficult, especially in females. Um, and a lot of times it's actually misdiagnosed. Um, it's more common in males, especially when they're hyperactive because the behavior is observable. Um, so deficits in attention and deficits in executive functioning skills are prominent with ADHD. Um, and from the school side, what we do is we can provide services for students who have ADHD. Um, this is a disabling category under IDEA, um, and we can provide special education services. They would have to meet the criteria under IDEA, um, which means essentially that it's impacting them to the degree that it's uh, impairing their academic performance. But we can provide different types of services, which can look like different classes that are a little bit smaller. Um, the students get a little bit more individualized attention. We can provide support for organization and planning skills um, and different accommodations within the classroom, um, such as extended time or whatever the student might need. Yeah, um, or breaking down um, larger projects into like you were saying, like the smaller chunks and having the teacher just like do that for the kids. I think these are the chunks um, and how you should break this project down. Um, other common things that we can do, you mentioned extra time. Extra time is kind of, um, can be tricky with executive functioning because sometimes kids will like, it, they use it too much and then it piles up and it backfires. So we always try to be careful with the extra time. Sometimes it's totally necessary, but sometimes it can actually cause more problems. Um, but doing things like, you know, copy of the teacher's notes, um, that sort of thing, um, you know, reminders to, you know, turn in um, the homework <laughs> and like, you know, not just telling the class, but like, hey, I'm gonna use my own son's name. Nathan, turn in your homework right now. Um, that sort of thing um, is stuff that the school can do. And we think these plans are very um, individualized for the student because um, like Emily said, it, they manifest differently in every single student. So like executive functioning is such a broad, um, term, but it can manifest itself in so many different ways. Other questions that you guys have? I guess, I mean, Emily, you touched on it about um, the effects of the pandemic and not kids not being in school for the past year and a half and seeing, um, you know, the effects that we're seeing at the school with that. And definitely, you know, I've talked to teachers and they definitely are seeing that, that, you know, especially with our freshmen and sophomores, but I mean, really all of the students, but we're definitely seeing with the freshmen and sophomores that missed out on, um, you know, the end of middle school, like they just are coming in, um, behind, um, not necessarily academically behind, but just in that it's really in the executive functioning and like their emotions and, um, you know, emotional regulation, but then also like knowing, you know, those tasks and things and those expectations that we have at a high at the high school that we expect they come in with, they're not. And so teachers are having to like backtrack a lot and like do a lot of like, okay, this is what we're expecting. Um, do you want to explain what IDEA is? You mentioned it, um, and it's yeah. not a program; it's a law. <laughs> I will. I will. Yeah. I just want to touch on what you just stated because I'm glad that you brought that up. Um, executive functioning skills are, you know skills that develop over the course of the lifetime through embedded supports in school and life, right? So a lot of times in school, you'll have kids in elementary school who the teachers will have each student take out their planner, they'll write it all down together, they'll check, they'll have the parents sign off. Um, so there are different skills that are kind of embedded in the school structure for <laughs> building those skills. Um, and I think through distance learning, a lot of times those skills weren't practiced because it was over Zoom, you can't necessarily check someone's work or check their planner or help them organize their materials. Um, so that's what we're working through now is kind of backtracking a little bit just to kind of help uh, support all of our students in the supports that they might not have received. There's also natural consequences um, and social emotional learning that impact executive functioning. 
that um, we kind of lacked through distance learning as well. Um, so IDEA is the Indivi uh, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. So this is what dictates through the Department of Education and this is what dictates our special education law. Under IDEA, there are 13 enabling categories, um, one of them being learning disabilities, another one being other health impaired, which is what uh, ADHD would fall under. This is a difficulty maintaining alertness to the educational environment and stimuli. Um, so in order for a student <clears throat> to qualify under IDEA and begin receiving special education services, they're assessed here at school. Um, so what we do is we provide a, a continuum of services at the school, and we really try and keep our students in what's called the least restrictive environment. So we want them exposed to the general education with typically developing peers as much as possible because we know that's best for growth. Um, so what we typically do if a student is starting to struggle, we'll provide accommodation through what's called an instructional support team. And this is usually a counselor, sometimes myself, the social worker, um, admin and the parent and the students involved as well. And we come up with different accommodations for their general education classes to help them succeed. If that's not enough, there are two different areas we can go. We can come up with a formalized accommodation plan. This is called a 504 accommodation plan for students with disabilities, but it doesn't provide any special education services. And if that's not successful, we assess for what's called an IEP, Individualized Education uh, Plan. And this will encompass the accommodations as well as special education services, which can be basic classes, uh, speech and language services, occupational therapy, um, transition services, college and career awareness. Yeah. Um, so I guess, you know, if you are concerned that your child is, um, not keeping up with their classes, falling behind, um, and you're worried about this and think that they need additional support, then reach out to us. Um, and so like Emily said, we start with the IST process. Um, you can reach out to me if, I, if I'm the easiest person for you to remember, um, you can reach out to me. I will refer it to uh, my associate principal and our team that does that. Um, but sometimes I know I'm the um, you know, person that's easiest to remember, and that's fine. I will direct it to the right people. Um, in order to have a student assessed, you have to submit the request in writing. Yes, to actually do the um, special ed assessment where we're gonna look, um, where Emily is actually um, one of the people that would do the testing, that does have to be a request in writing. And not just an email, like it has to be, um, we need like what you call a wet signature. So it would have to be something that you actually dropped off at school. Um, and for, for Amy, I'm going to put my contact information in the chat here, and this way you can reach out to me via email and we can set up an appointment. But yeah, I'm always here to, if you guys just have questions, I'm here for consultation with families as well, so um, absolutely. Yeah, so let me answer this question. Are you going to consolidate school loop, Google Classroom, Infinite Campus into one tool? Well, I'm not, um, because I am not. Um, you know, a tech person that's going to do that. Um, but that is the goal for the district that um, this year they're looking into different platforms that are out there that will consolidate all of this that next school year, like we all will just be using one platform. Um, I know it is very confusing this year and I do apologize for that. Um, it's just, we're in a transition year from moving away from school loop and moving into a new platform that is yet unnamed. Um, so um, please just bear with us this year. If you cannot log into school loop, you, um, Rupert Rosales, and I'm gonna put his email address in the chat, he will help you. Any other questions? We don't have a COVID office. We have the we have the office. The office is open from seven to four. Um. So, um, 
but remember that if you just did the COVID test where you took it home, um, the COVID tests are picked up on Wednesdays. So actually if you were, cause today is Thursday, so it's not gonna be picked up for another week. So I would actually recommend getting a new test and testing in the beginning of the um, week. So, and that's not something we can control. We obviously don't do the test analysis here. <laughs> we, we are not equipped for that. Um, there is a company that comes and picks them up and they pick them up on Wednesdays at 9.30. Um, so that's why when in my communication, I've always said, try a test on Tuesday um, because then that's the closest to when the tests are being picked up. Um, so quick question, very curious. As a parent, we worry about kids' behavior, but what if a kid denied it? What should a parent do? So I guess, and you're saying that um, you're pretty sure that if your child did something, but they're like, no, I didn't do that. Um, Emily, I, what do you think? <laughs> I mean, and I, as a parent, I fully sympathize. And that's always a teenager's one of the things that they develop, one of the skills that they develop in their teenage years is the ability to lie. Um, it, it, it's an, and I, that was a very, it, as I'm personal experience, it was a very difficult thing for me to realize, especially with my daughter, because I trusted her implicitly. And I was like, no, she doesn't do, like, she tells me everything. I fully, I think in par my, in parent meetings in the past years, I have bragged about my relationship with my daughter and how much she tells me everything. And I know everything that's going on. And then found out I absolutely did not. Um, and I, it blew me away that she, somebody that as a child could not lie if her life depended on it. And I would always know when she was lying that she got very good at it. Um, and so that is a skill that teenagers um, develop. And it's very difficult for us as parents um, to accept that. So Emily, I don't know if you have any advice about that. Yeah, um, it's very typical for teens to um, lie for, for self-preservation, right? They don't want to get in trouble. Sometimes they don't want to um, ruin their perception of themselves in your eyes. Um, so, I mean, a lot of the, the reasons teens will lie is because of fear, right? So being able to have an open discussion about whatever it is that you feel the child was lying about, um, maybe kind of explaining to them how you would react if something like that happened, um, just so that they, you know, that, that kind of diminishes some of the anxiety, I think, of approaching a parent. Um, but yeah, I think just being able to have open communication with your child, um, even if they do lie, um, just to continue to establish that that relationship is beneficial for the future. Yeah, exactly. Then that was how we as a family had to get over our own stuff that was going on that, you know, my daughter just, she didn't want to disappoint us. You know, she just did not want, you know, she knew that we had high expectations and she didn't want to disappoint us. And so we had to have, you know, a lot of family conversations about, you know, how long does disappointment last and like what's really like the most important thing. Um, and, you know, for all of us as parents, of course, we want our kids to be healthy and happy. Um, and that's um, what's most important. Um, So, thank you. Um, well, the school um, staff, well, hold on, before I get to that one, let me, um, so about the COVID testing. Yes, if the result is positive, absolutely, you would find out right away, um, we would contact you. So um, it may be because the tests, like I said, they're picked up on Wednesday, it's same day results. So it may be Wednesday night, if not Wednesday night, Thursday morning. If you hear nothing, then you, it was a negative test because um, we don't contact you for negative tests. Um, will the school staff help put in an effort to ask about, um, to ask the student to accept help from the school since we're at work unable to follow them in school? Um, so yeah, so what happens is the parent is the one that usually initiates a request for, you know, assessment or for us to do the IST. Um, when we do this work, we always involve the student in that. Um, that's actually very um, important in the high school setting uh, to involve the student in these meetings and this plans. Um, a lot of times this is different than if you had meetings with a school in elementary school or even in middle school. In middle school, they might start you bringing in the student. Um, but high school, we absolutely do because 
we want the student to be have a voice in their plan. Um, and I totally understand the student's reluctance to admit that something's going on. Um, that's where you have to, you know, trust us and our experience of working with teenagers that this is what we do for a living. And so whereas you may not be able to break through with your child um, and get them to admit stuff that's going on, we are actually pretty good at it. Um, so we definitely, um, and a lot of times it may be having a conversation with your child without you there um, that, you know, we kind of follow up with them and say, okay, really what's going on? Like, tell me about it. And they'll they'll usually tell us and we can usually convince them like hey you know a lot of times they think that if they ask for help or they get these accommodations um that everybody in the class will know um that they get extra time and our teachers are very good at knowing how to give additional um supports without anybody knowing that it's just between the teacher and the student and that nobody else knows um, it is definitely i totally understand that you know some students they they don't want other students to know i mean peer pressure and academic peer pressure, which is something that we talk a lot about here at Piedmont, it's a very real thing. Um, and some students don't wanna admit that um, they um, aren't keeping up the way they think they should be, um, but it's okay. Nobody else will know, we're, we're pretty good at that. No problem. Um, slow running computer, computer still running slowly in the computer graphic design class. Are you talking about the Chromebook? Um, if they're talking about a Chromebook, talk, um, yeah, talk to the teacher um, for the um, graphic design class. Um, we may have other options available. So definitely they should talk to the teacher about what, what's going on. Um, and so we may have some other options available, but talk to the teacher. Um, how do you access your child's email? Because they cannot send emails to us. Are you saying the teachers can't send emails to you? The teachers can send email to you. Um, can I speak? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, yeah, Please. I'm just saying that I, I, um, with Barryessa, we were able, I was able to get into their emails, so I was able to see what directly what was coming through. So for a great example is back to school night, I could not access his email, so therefore I saw zero um, Zoom links except for if the teacher sent to me directly. Okay, so I can't access it. I couldn't look at it, and he can't send it out to me. So I have to use his device in order to. He um, can't forward you emails? Yeah, it's like it's locked. I don't know why. Oh, that's weird. So yeah, I so know, I'll, let, it, okay. Let me look into that because I mean, I would think that he would be able to forward you emails. Um, that's, I, 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 I wonder if they have some sort of weird restriction on it. Um, I have I, a, sorry, Jenny, I have a ahead. setting that, um, anything that's sent to my son, it's automatically CC'd to me. So maybe it could be a setting. Oh, how do you do that, um, Virginia, in this? <laughs> I don't remember how it was done. We did it um, last year, but I receive everything that he receives. Anything that's sent to him, I'll like get CC'd on it. Is it through Google Classroom you're getting that? Um, good question. Gosh, we use so many platforms. Because I know with Google Classroom. Oh, school I, loop. Okay. Okay. So if it's a school loop thing, yeah, then I think that that, um, you know what, um, Dominique, I'm going to put my email address in here. Um, go ahead and contact me directly and then we can. Um, Find out what's going on. Okay. Um, and let me brainstorm some stuff of what's going on with that. Um, thank you. We're doing an amazing job accommodating, keeping things discreet. <laughs> Good. Um, yeah, I hope. I mean, and I'm as 
I have two children with ADHD. Um, I have two children that have had five, uh, that, well, my daughter has graduated, so she doesn't have an active 504 plan, but my son does. Um, and so this is something that, you know, very personal to me. Um, and so it is something that um, we do take really, really seriously. Um, we absolutely want to give the kids the support um, that they need and um, do it in a way that they feel comfortable. What's really important, I think, with um, students with ADHD, ADHD is not something they're necessarily going to grow out of. I mean, it's a lifetime thing. I mean, I'm an adult with ADHD. What happens is you learn how to deal with it and you learn how to manage it. Um, and so that's really, especially in the high school setting, what our goal is, is to teach them the tools that they need to, um, because again, it's very individualized. What works for one student doesn't necessarily work for another student. And so helping the student figure out what's going to work for them so that when they're an adult, they don't forget to pay their bills. They, you know, they, they, they know how to like be an adult and like function. Um, it's really important. I'm glad that you said that because <clears throat> when I'm working with students who have difficulty with executive functioning or who have a diagnosis of ADHD, we go through a lot of different strategies because a lot of times what works for one student doesn't work for another. So sometimes you're trial and error trying different strategies for planning or for organization until the child finds one that you know works for them or is easy for them to implement. Um, so don't feel disheartened if you your student has trouble with one aspect of you know a coping techniques such as using the planner. Um, these skills can be built and there are alternative ways to build those skills as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and what's um, really great is when your kids start using, like, because they start learning the terminology and they like throw it back out you. Because I was like with my son, like, he's like, I need a minute to process. Stop bugging me. <laughs> and I was like, oh, all right. Minute to process. Okay. <laughs> Um, question for Ms. Mathai, is there any fair chance for them to finish high school or college? Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. In fact, um, one of the things uh, about executive functioning is it's so important that it almost, um, you know, is more important than, well, I read one article that said it's more important than IQ and math and reading readiness, right? But the good thing is these are skills that can be taught and built. Um, and once those neural connections are more established, students can be extremely successful. Um, and students, especially in high school, because their brains are so plastic um, and because they're still developing, they have you know, a great opportunity to build these skills while they're here with us. And we can provide the scaffolding and the modeling to help them build those skills. So absolutely. I mean, especially in the general population, even if you don't have a diagnosis, people tend to struggle with certain aspects of executive functioning. For me, it's it's memory. Um, that's my weakness for sure. I have to write everything down and that's how I've coped and that's how I've gotten through school. Um, so it's just finding things that work for you, but absolutely they can be successful. Yeah. Um, for senior students who prepare for college in September, October, during the social distancing time, what parents can do follow up and reach out to the school for help? Um, definitely the academic counselors. Um, so if you, um, they are doing, starting to do presentations. Um, I know they've got one for juniors, I think, coming up, and they, they will do one for seniors about the college application process. So pay attention um, to the counseling page on our website. They post everything um, and when they're going to be doing presentations. If you have specific questions, reaching out to the academic counselor. I know we're down one counselor right now. We actually have hired somebody. Um, we're just waiting for her paperwork to be officially done. Um, I honestly, I think probably it's probably gonna be officially done that week that we're in um, set for fall break, um, which is gonna be bad timing. Um, but when we return from fall break, she will be in place. So we have hired somebody. Um, so um, if you guys are in that part of the alpha that, that um, Ms. Rodriguez left um, and you have a, Temporary counselor, um, just a couple more weeks of that when we return from fall break, we'll have a permanent counselor in. Um, all right, I love this. My, I, 
My husband has this problem. He says he works better under pressure too. Um, my kid says that she works better under pressure. So she always does her assignment the night before the due date. She chooses to spend time with friends and refuses to do homework on the weekends, even though she knows she'll have a tough week ahead if she doesn't have some work done on the weekend. I can see lack of sleep is taking a toll on her. How do we help the kid if she doesn't want to change? This is a great question. And I, if I had a nickel for every time, <laughs> um, this is true for a lot of teenagers. Um, telling ourselves that we work under pressure is really the biggest fallacy that we tell ourselves. Um, it's kind of a coping mechanism for procrastination. Um, so if a student doesn't want to change or is um, you know, defensive against you know, changing or utilizing these strategies, I would say utilizing different behavior modification techniques so even though it's gonna be imposed on the child, it does help them um, kind of structure and build those habits. So for example, not allowing her to see her friends until she puts in one to two hours of homework on the weekend or studies. Um, so some of these things will have to be imposed, but you can work through this with um, you know, using the motivation, um, like different rewards or different things they want to do um, just to help her build those skills. So she might need this structure from you um, right now until it's kind of ingrained in, into a habit. Yeah, um, and I totally, I totally sympathize. I mean, oh gosh, yes, absolutely have this. Um, and like I said, my husband is totally this way and he's an adult, but then I see my son following the same mm -hmm. footsteps. Um, you know, one thing that Emily said that, you know, in her presentation that really, it struck a chord with me that I was like, you know, we need to be a lot better about that as a family is the consistency. Um, you know, we get very like when there's like a big project or something like that, like, oh my gosh, we have to like buckle down, but then we let it slide. Um, and so just being, I think the consistency of like just having, you know, if she wants to go out and like hang out with her friends in the weekends. Okay. But like Emily said, she does one or two, um, you know, hours of homework before. And like, it's just a negotiation, like, okay, you're going to allow something, but she has to give you something. Um, and that, um, you know. Yeah, um, to piggyback off of that, um, you know, once, once you have imposed this structure on the child, if they're having difficulty completing the work in that moment, right? Um, so that's when you're gonna implement some of the strategies. So for example, um, breaking down the assignment, providing uh, scheduled breaks. Um, so every 20 minutes, you get a five minute break. Every hour you get 15, something like that. Um, because it sounds like there also might be some difficulty with perseverance through difficult tasks um, or task initiation. So you can utilize those strategies once you have that structure in place. I mean, and that's stuff, I mean, I think it's something that often we do as adults. I mean, definitely I do it. Like if I have a big task I have to do and a big project I have to do that I know is going to take me like a really long time, I will, you know, set my timer on my phone and be like, okay, I'm going to work on this for a half hour. And then I'm going to get up for 10 minutes. I'm going to walk around. I'm going to go do something, you know, I'm going to look at my phone. I'll do something else. And then I'll come back and like, I'll set my timer. So that is actually a really great strategy for kids when they don't want to, and they get just easily distracted by things is having like setting a timer and be like, okay, and 30 minutes might be too long. I mean, I'm 47, I can handle 30 minutes, but you know, a 15 year old, maybe that it's 10 minutes, maybe it's 15. Like you might have to play around with that a little bit. And what's like a time amount where you, they could actually sit down and like focus and then letting them have those breaks. That's a really great strategy. So we are coming to the end of our time. Um, thank you guys. I hope this was helpful. Um, I, like I said, this is something that, you know, is so, so common in teenagers. And even if it doesn't manifest itself to the you know, point where they need a 504 plan or IEP, like so many teenager, teenagers deal with this. Like, you know, we said their brains are developing. Um, it's very, very common. Um, so hopefully this, this was helpful and you guys took away some strategies that maybe will work for you at home. And um, next week, I'm excited about next week, um, Ms. Gunter and Ms. Marshall will be back and they are going to talk about our brand new wellness center and what we're going to be offering at Piedmont Hills this year in terms of the wellness center. So I'm really excited um, for next week, but I will see you guys then. Thank you so much. And thank you, Emily, for joining and presenting today. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Yeah.
Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thanks.